please, if you don't know already, I'm Jordan Smurr, I'm a your guest of honor. Um, I'm a puppeteer and a puppet builder. Uh, the first question that most people ask me is, how did you get into puppetry? Um, like just about everybody, I was into it as a kid. And then in high school, it was not cool. And then when I got older, I started realizing this could be a job. And uh, so I worked, um, I worked a lot of different jobs, but uh, the last 25 years, I worked in special effects, uh, building models and props and doing effects for the local ad industry here in Minneapolis. Um, I did work on a couple of movies. Uh, if you ever saw Mall Rats, I designed and built Kevin Smith's Batman gun that he uses to escape in that film. Um, it wasn't a lot of money and it wasn't a lot of fame, but <laughs> I did that. Um, uh, my, my other claim to fame is I used to make hats for the Ziploc Finger Man. Uh, <laughs> Ziploc Finger Man, they draw a little face on it and then like you wear a hat. And to delineate, I only did the hats for the still photography hats, <laughs> as opposed to the TV spots, which you know, they had to be built in New York because they were shooting from there, etc. Um, so, uh, you're all here to learn about professional puppet making. Um, I'm going to tell you how I do it. Uh, the things, the, the ways that I do things, many of them are similar or exactly the same as the way they do it in the puppet shop. Mm. Um, some things are the way I do them because I've just found ways of doing things that I think are easier. Every puppet builder does things different, uh, and uh, one of the uh, actually one of the big uh, misconceptions that people seem to have or have gotten uh, from the publicity coming from uh, the Muppets is that every puppet is sewn by hand entirely. This is false. Uh, you don't pay someone to hand stitch a seam that you can just as easily sew on a machine. Uh, and that's the money aspect of it. Uh, you, when, when you need to make 12 puppets and you have a week, you don't sew them by hand. You would need to get you know six people in to sew them by hand, and with one person you have done it in an afternoon. Um, there are certain parts of a puppet that you'll want to sew by hand, and certain effects that that gives you. So um, that's an important thing to be able to delineate to, to understand. Um, other than that, I think I can start on talking about um, resources. Um, actually, no, I'm going to start talking about materials. Bag of materials. Water, dump this stuff out. The magic microphone sound. Uh, now, uh, the puppets that I'm going to be talking about are mostly what I call television puppets. A lot of people will call them Muppets. I don't call them that because that term is owned by the Disney Corporation. Um, and not even the Henson Company can really legally use that term anymore because they sell it. Um, usually, from the inside out, when you're dealing with a puppet, you're making the understructure out of foam. And I've got a couple of different types of foam here. Um, standard kind of squishy urethane foam. This is the kind of stuff you use for seat cushions, that sort of thing. I work in half inch sheet foam. Um, some guys will prefer to work a little thicker, but half inch is a good, a, a, a good usable uh, uh, thickness and it's readily available. You can get it at your fabric store or if you have like a fabric outlet or an upholstery store or a foam supplier. You can usually always get just about any kind of foam in half inch sheet. Um, and four by eight of this is typically around $30, maybe a little less. Um, then there's this stuff, this black kind of packing foam. Um, I don't use this very often. But I will use it when I need something that has a lot more kind of structure to it. This is a little denser. It's a little 
it's almost crispier than the other stuff. It doesn't compress as easily. Um, and uh, when I want a when I want a really strong shape, but it still has to be a little squishy, I'll use this stuff. Yeah. Um, then the thing you always hear about is this stuff. And this is the stuff with all the little holes in it. Um, it's, it's reticulated foam is the technical word for it. Some people call it Scott foam, which is based off of a brand name. Uh, but this stuff is getting harder and harder to get. And I don't know why. But um, you will probably need to contact a foam supplier. And I say on the sheets, uh, your best friend is the Yellow Pages because go to the Yellow Pages and you can actually look up foam suppliers in your city. And you will probably find some place that can get their hands on this. And this, once again, is half inch sheet. Um, this stuff is really good uh, for doing exterior work and actually building what I call raw body puppets where you're not covering them with fabric. Uh, if you remember on the original Muppet Show, uh, Floyd. In fact, most of the band, uh, the, the, the Electric Mayhem band, were made out of this. The newer versions of them are all covered in fabric. But originally, if you watch the, the first one, yeah, Gonzo's beak is made out of this material. And actually, they carve it out of a block. And I have a piece of that, just so you can feel that. Um, this stuff is incredibly expensive if you can find it. Yeah, compared a to other four forms. 4 by 8 sheet of 4 inch thick is around $1,500. And i got no idea why. I think it's the process they have to put it through. But um, it's, it's really handy when you're doing, well, like Gonzo's beat, right? They're clipping out the shape. And, when, and here's, here's the thing you may hear, and it's true. Every one of Gonzo's beaks is carved by hand to a template and then painted with an airbrush and everything because you, there's, there's no way to do it otherwise. I mean, they could make a sculpture and make a mold and cast copies, but it wouldn't be the same because you can't cast this stuff. Um, Tim, Tim Lagasse is a guy that I know out in LA, um, and uh, he actually, for the, I think it was the last month of film, I don't remember which one, um, they hired him to do beaks for Gonzo, and he said that he carved like six of them, and they only accepted one, and you know, it was, it was just difficult, um, but uh, this is, this is kind of cool stuff to, to look at. If you can find it, it's fun to work with. Um, the other thing that people will say, and you'll run into builders who say, reticulated foam, that's the stuff to use. Always use reticulated foam, because it lasts longer, and it's lighter, and it's you know uh, all kinds of things that are more wonderful than regular foam. I've never, I've never found it to last really any longer than regular foam. Um, it is lighter because it's actually just a matrix. It's not like full foam. Um, and it, it does have good structural qualities and it glues really well. Um, but, and it breathes pretty well. Um, but it's a lot more expensive than regular foam. If you're just doing it as a hobby, just use regular foam. Uh, I, I can't, uh, you know. I, I can't recommend it as a hobby material because of the price. Uh, but uh, you know, if you want to work with it, go ahead and spend the money. Right? There are things that I do that are more expensive than they really should be, but I like the way they work. So, uh, uh, Things about cutting foam. I'll talk real quickly about cutting foam. Uh, typically when you do pattern and you're, you're, I just mark it on the foam with a Sharpie marker. Um, a lot of people will use disposable razor blades, you know, the one side ones with a little bridge on the back so you can kind of, you know, use them the cut way. Uh, for me personally, I find those to be a little inaccurate. They're just, you know, it's harder to know where you're, where you're cutting with. So I spend the money and I buy X-Acto blades. Now, X-Acto blades are more expensive than they should be and Urethane foam dulls a blade like nobody's business. 
you you will make you know several cuts and then you'll have to get a new blade. But um, then other other types of foam, other fun foams. Um, this stuff is called iCell, and I've never used it. Um, I have it as an example. Uh, this stuff is uh, well. This particular sample is called L200. It depends on which foam distributor you get it from. It could be L400, it could be L4000, it could be L2000. It all depends on how they want to market. Uh, but if you really want to know, if you really want the guy on the other end of the phone to understand what you're talking about, you say, I want a closed cell phone or a uh, uh, cross link phone. And I want it in a half inch. Uh, and this stuff uh, works really, really well for making what are called body pots. Uh, you know that little shape that you put to make a tummy out of on a puppet? Especially if you want something that isn't going to easily collapse. This stuff makes really strong, firm shapes. And so you know, it, it's still a little flexible and it's still kind of soft. But it, it won't <coughs> completely collapse on you. Like um, if, if you made a body pod out of the green stuff, it would it would tend to want to just scrunch if you put any pressure on it. This stuff actually holds up really well and uh, 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 has has more structure to it. Um, some nice all over the floor. This you know I think this is pretty much the same thing. It just seems to have like a skin on it and. I don't know, you could probably do something cool. It's got a weird texture for that. It's kind of elephantine. How long did you find something like this? Um, a phone distributor, phone, phone, phone place. Look for, actually you can look under phone or you can look under um, upholstery. There's one in Bloomington, A1 Foam and Fabrics. That's where I buy um, most of my stuff. Them. That's where I buy most of my, my foam supplies. Although they no longer can get Articulated foam. Yeah, the blocks they won't they won't they can't get that. And I in fact we asked about sheets and they can't get sheets either. Um, you can get a limited amount from uh, Project Puppet, which is also listed on the thing. Project Puppet, I'm gonna I'll mention them now. They have a great website. They provide fantastic patterns that are easy to start you off. So you can the patterns that they have work really well as a basic training tool to learn how to do puppets with. But you can also embroider on top of what they've given you, and that's an artistic term, I'm not talking about actual embroidery. Um, you, can, you can add to them, you can modify those patterns very easily, and you can uh, create whole new things out of them just by adding or taking away a little bit here and there. Um, projectpuppet.com, it's on your cheat sheet. Yep. And, not that I'm gonna do a stripper routine for you here, but this is the Puppet Cheat Shirt, available at Project Puppet. And it has all kinds of stuff. Um, when you're looking for reticulated foam, how do you remember? It's 35 PPI, that stands for pores per inch. Um, here's a little diagram of how to make a blinking eyeball. Uh, here's Project Puppet down here. Um, uh, circumference pi times the diameter. Uh, you know, all the handy things to remember when you're actually building a puppet are here on this shirt brought to you by Project Puppet. Now, that being said, I don't get a kickback for all this. Um, they're just very, really nice guys. Um, so, that's a, that's a cool thing. Um, oh, something I discovered that works really, really well, and I love it a lot, so I use it on everything. Uh, car headliner material. This is a fabric backed with a foam. I use this on the interior of the puppet, where your hand touches the inside of the palette. It's just more comfortable, and it's, it's a little squishy. And if you want to put loops to stick your fingers <coughs> inside, you can stitch them right on here. So, you know, you can stitch them on before you install it. And this uh, I got at um, Hancock Fabrics. Um, it's, it's in the upholstery section. Is it like quarter inch? Yeah, it's like quarter inch. Um, 
it really doesn't have a lot of impact when you put it on the inside. It doesn't take up a lot of space. So I tend to, you know, I, I put that inside every puppet I make. Um, it's just, it, it feels more comfortable. It's a nice, nice thing to touch on. Yep, yep, the fabric side is the finger side. Um, if you're going to stitch something down to that, I usually use um, woven elastic. Um, I've found trouble with stitching the other types of elastic. You get the woven elastic, and uh, if you want to stitch it right to that, you have to put a piece of paper under it on your on your sewing machine because the the tread foot doesn't like the foam. It doesn't want to move it underneath the pressure foot. So you have to put a piece of paper there so it'll slide under. Um, let's see. So those are the types of foam that you put on the interior of the bubble. And uh, let's let's talk about uh, making a pattern for your foam. So a lot of puppets will have a foam skull and maybe a foam body pod inside. So if you're doing a custom puppet, if you're not working for somebody else's pattern. This is how I achieve results. What you see on the, on the far left here, that's pink insulation foam. It's that pink panther foam you can buy at the hardware store. Um, you can get it in, in four by eight sheets for, uh, I think it's like 12 to 20 bucks at um, Home Depot. And what I do is I start with, if, if, my, if my puppet character is um, bilateral, right? It's gonna be same on both sides. I only carve one half of the design. So I'll start with the profile, and this guy was a fox, um, and that guy was a uh, loon, and then the guy in the far, you can't hardly see him, I think was the bear. But um, so I'll, ca I'll carve this rough shape. And really what I'm trying to get here are the major shapes of the head. Not a lot of detail, you're not going to get a lot of detail out of it, um, but it's going to give you a general uh, shape and size. Um, you will notice farther along in the process when you have built this foam shape based on your pattern that's going to be larger than your original pattern because when you take a piece of foam and you bend it around a curve, it wants to push outward. So that's you know, you're going to get maybe 12 to 15 percent larger. Um, and so I'll tell you how to fix that. But the next step in this process is to cover it in duct tape. And what I do is I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll buy a bunch of silver duct tape because it's cheap, and then I'll buy a couple of rolls of colored duct tape. And the reason why I do that is because when you start out, your bottom layer, you want to do two layers at least. Your bottom layer, I do in silver tape because, you know, just here. Then, uh, the next layer that I put on top of that, I'll use the colored tape. And the reason why is just so I know where I've been and how I've got it covered. So I have everything completely covered twice. And you want to work crossing each other. Um, so uh, say I'll, I'll be working on this edge, right? You work from here. And I'll use the natural clean edge of the tape to go around like this and I'll just lay those pieces on. Then when I'm going back through and doing the second layer, I'll tear off a chunk and I'll use the raw edge here and lay it up. So that they're, they're actually, the, the grain of the tape is, is laying across each other this way. Um, that keeps it from shifting. Um, you know, if, you lay, if you lay two pieces of, of duct tape, there's a natural stretch to the duct tape and it's usually a one direction, direction stretch. Um, if you lay them all going the same direction, you will get an odd stretch to your pattern when you pull it off. So you want to make sure that it's as stable as possible. Then, after I get them all covered up and he's good, he's, he's um, every, I've, I've, I've put tape everywhere that I want to be foam for the skull. I will go in with a good Sharpie marker and I'll decide where I'm going to start separating these pattern pieces out. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, you'll become familiar with the qualities of foam. Um, and if you're mixing types of foam, you'll eventually become familiar with how different foams react when you put them together, um, how
how one will be stiffer and it'll make one not so flexible. Um, but so I'll, I'll draw in where I want the seams to go. Now I know some people want to try to, um, they want to try and make the pattern in as few pieces as possible. Well, when you do that, you get a pattern piece, here's one that we were just at, you get a pattern piece that looks like this. And that's really complex. And if you're not paying attention, you can really mess this up, which is why I've got notes all over this thing. Um, really, honestly, I could have separated it right here and made my life a whole lot easier because the, the smaller the pieces are, the more you can fit on your phone and not conflict with each other um, because this is all waste, this is all waste. You know, these, these little tight darts in here, that's all waste. Um, you know, so if you, can, if you can find a way to minimize the amount of foam that you're wasting, you're gonna save a lot of money. Um, so, but this is, this is the fox head, this is the fox skull. Um, fox skull. And I've got this mark, this is the center seam. Uh, let's see. Top side of the snout. This is the center front of the snout. This is the mouth hole. And this is the chin. And that is the neck hole. And then these are all just kind of contour darts that bring it back. Now also, um, this piece being the center seam, if I'm not mistaken, I, this, this folds in. Now you've got two pieces and they're going to make two halves of the hole. Um, there's another piece on the top of the snout that fits here. And then this glues down on the top of this edge. So it, it's a little complex, but when you're actually working it, and you, you, you know, hopefully you got on this project I was building 15 puppets at a time, um, and not all the same. They're all different. So, um, but there you go. This is this is the, the result of all those things. Now you'll notice. Go back to the thing. Um, only a big general shape likeness going on. Go to our, go to our phone guy. So. This is, this is a lot less defined than it is on my paint pattern. Um, and it all looks a little bit more puffy, a little more bulbous. Um, but that's something you, as you, as you practice, as you, as you get into the process, you'll learn how to handle those and how to take advantage of that. Really simple one. Really simple one. Okay, this is actually based on one of the project puppet patterns. Um, they make a thing called the, uh, the glorified sock puppet. Mm -hmm. um, that puppet pattern does not have a foam skull. It only has this foam mouth plate. And so when I was doing, I did a, I did a beaver dunk and I did a gopher. And when I was doing those, I actually did modifications. Well, I had the skull for the gopher. And then when I wanted to do the beaver, I wanted his head wider. So I actually added a one inch strip all the way down the middle of the skull. So it made it one inch wider. And then when I did the skunk, I wanted his nose longer. So I actually added a one inch, a one inch strip here at the corner of the mouth and made it actually a little bit longer. And just, just delineated them enough so that they have, each have a little different character to them but all working from the same pattern. And that's what's great about the Project Puppet stuff. You can get away with that. Um, but this, this foam skull pattern was actually made from, uh, from the, the fabric pattern that goes over the top. And I had to trim it a little bit because obviously if you cut it out of foam, it's gonna get bigger, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, in the end, it ended up working quite well on the um, So that's, that's the basic process that I use for getting the foam pattern. The, uh, the process of getting the fabric on the outside, if you're gonna go that direction, um, you can do one of two things. 
you can actually go back and do this same process again on top of your, your uh, squishy foam skull. The problem being is that uh, unless you build two of them, you're going to end up damaging that squishy foam skull with the duct tape. It's just going to want to grab on. Even if you detack it on your hands first, it's still going to want to grab on. Um, and it's, it works. It's really a detailed process, and it takes you twice as long. If you're just doing a one-off, it's easier just to drape. And the draping process, I don't think I have any pictures up here, but um, bring up a picture of a foam skull. So in the process of draping, what you're going to do is you, you, you try to get some fabric that's disposable but has similar properties to what you're going to finally work with. So if I was going to do this, if I was going to cover this in Muppet fleece, the expensive Muppet fleece, which actually I'll do that right now, hand out some of that. Um, Entron fleece. This stuff is made by the Entron, or was made by the Entron company. I've got some pieces of the original type. Actually, that's a piece of the original. Maybe green is a piece of the original. So this is original Antron fleece. This is the stuff that the muffins are covered in. And um, a while ago, which is probably more than a decade ago now, uh, the Pepsi company bought the Antron company and as a result, decided that they were going to stop production on anything that was not a carpet fiber. So the original Antron fleece went out of production, and every puppet maker nearly had an aneurysm. Does Disney or the Henson Company? The Henson Company bought everything that was left. Yeah, they bought like a warehouse full of this stuff. Which is now owned by the Disney. Now owned by Disney. Yes, it was all transferred, and it's in a vault at Disney. Um, eventually, what happened was, so I think this is an original piece too. Um, what can you pass along there? Um, what happened was uh, there was an outcry, and everybody said, "Oh my God, we got to have Antron fleece. If we're going to keep making Muppets or puppets or whatever, we got to have this stuff." And not only do the Muppets use it, but uh, like mascot companies will use it because it's really handy. And the best thing about it is that, like the original stuff, you sew a seam, you can either sew it by hand or sew it by machine, and it's easy to pull that pile up out of the seam and disguise it so that it looks like it's not even there. And that was, that was the main reason why they used this fabric in the first place. Um, that, that process was kind of discovered by, uh, uh, um, shoot, it. Uh, Don Celine. Um, and uh, so uh, eventually what happened was there was there was enough of a demand that a mill in Georgia decided that they were going to buy the rights to produce Antron fleece. Uh, unfortunately, the, the original fiber that they used to make it was no longer being manufactured, so they had to find a substitute. The substitute they found was not quite as thick a fiber. And so the new stuff has a much finer grain to it, and it just, it's a little more difficult to work with. You can still achieve decent results, but most people who have worked with the old stuff just kind of shake their heads and cry whenever they have to work with the new stuff. Um, and, uh, but it is what it is. The old stuff also had a great property of being able to dye very well. Um, and and when, when, when you dye the old stuff, you can use rip dye, and it takes a beautiful color. Um, in fact, Ernie on Sesame Street is sunshine orange. That's our sunshine orange? Yeah, whatever. Rip dye, whatever, number something. And peach. Peach is awful. Uh, they no longer make peach rip dye because peach is no longer a stylish color for prom dresses. <laughs> and uh, so peach red dye is very, very valuable right now because that it, it is the perfect color to dye fleece 
to make flesh tone. Who has the Cauc flesh tone? Caucasian piece flesh tone. It's floating around. It's over here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's peach. So the last time I bought peach dye, I had to get it from someone off of Etsy in Australia. And she happened to have like four boxes left and I bought it. Can I remind you real quick? Yes, I can do that too. Um, oh, hey, here's something cool about reticulated foam. Um, I use it to make tongues. And it works really easily because you can just get in there with scissors and clip it. The texture on it is very forgiving. That foam, you know, I, it's, um, you, can, you can be pretty crude with it and still get a decent result. The other trick that I've been taught <coughs> by someone who worked with it is that once you have it clipped and if you want to get it really nice and smooth, you get one of those little battery-op razors that you use to take the pills off of your sweater with, mm -hmm. and you use that, and you just rub it on the surface, and it will take down and make it all nice and smooth. So that piece of, of reticulated foam and the tongue was clipped, uh, clipped with the scissors and then had the, the razor job done to it. And then I used spray acrylic paint to paint it up. Now it used to, it used to be the buff color of the reticulated foam that I was handing around. And now it is red with you know a darker low light on it. Um, I, I was using Montana spray paint, so you can get them at an art store. Um, and it works great for painting that stuff. Don't load it on, you know, mist it on, let the color build up. But uh, it works fantastic, and it's color fast. Um, real quick mention of fake fur. This is a piece of fake fur that I got from V Corp, and they are a local company. They do all of Sesame Street Live. Um, so they are, they're building, you know, the big, big bird and the big cookie monster and, you know, ice skating rinks and all that kind of thing. Um, this is what they call an amoeba at the shop. And cookie monster is actually not solid fake fur. Their big costume is not solid fake fur. They actually have a suit that is made out of like a mesh netting. And then they will sew these on that mesh netting, they all kind of interlock, but they leave just a little gap in between so that suit breathes when the, when the actor is moving around. Um, this is really, really cool fur. This is a lot longer than most normal furs that you find at the fabric store. I don't know who their supplier is, but when I'm online and looking to buy quality fake fur that is better than most of the stuff you get at Joann's or at Hancock Fabrics. I look up Mendel's.com, Mendel's Fake Fur. They're on Haight Street in, in uh, San Francisco. And Jennifer and I were in San Francisco recently and we actually walked down there and got to be very careful with her. <laughs> that, uh, we, had, we had sold enough puppets at the convention previous that we had enough room in the suitcases. We got about six yards. <laughs> to stuff in there and take home with okay, We're, we're going to be paying for shipping those case, those you know, suitcases home anyway, so why not fill them with fur? I glow in black light. <laughs> yes. Black light furs and all kinds of stuff. But um, yes, fake fur is expensive, especially quality fake fur. When you go to the fabric store and you find cheap fake fur, when you start working with it, you'll know exactly why. Um, Usually the backing is really fragile um, and it's, uh, it tends to not have as much, uh, as many fibers woven into it, so it's kind of sparse um, and it tends to, it tends to you know, be really kind of weak, um, good fake furs. Uh, if you're local, you can try going to um, SR Harris Fabric Warehouse. And they have a really good supply of fake fur. Um, but a lot of it is the stuff that they make like fake fur coats out of. So it is extremely heavy and very thick. It has like, you know, a really deep, thick pile underneath, which is kind of cool to work with, but it's a pain to sew. Um, so um, back to patterning. 
there's, uh, I don't know if it's on your sheet, but there's another place online called Distinctive Fabrics, yes. which also sells a really nice selection of paper. Just so you know, really good paper tends to be about 40 to $50 a yard. So when people are like, why is your puppet, you know, $500? It's like, well, it's $200 in fake fur. Because you also can't, because fake fur is unidirectional, you also can't turn your pieces upside down. So you have to, you know, yeah. use it in the most poor way possible. Yeah, really. In a um, visual way. There yeah. you go. It's uh, fake, fake fur when you're cutting tends to be really inefficient. Um, when you're doing fleece, you can tend to, I mean, you can, you know, turn your pattern pieces because fleece is, it's got a, you know, a nap to it, but it, it isn't really directional. Um, if you want to be really careful about it, it can be, but um, most of the time you can pretty much turn your patterns to fit on that square of fabric, however you like. Um, fake fur has a nap. And if you cut the nap going the wrong direction, it really looks weird. So um, that's that's a thing that you got to watch out for. Um, and I've done it. <laughs> I've I've gotten I've gotten a full pattern cut out and realized that I, I cut like half of it going the wrong way, and just wanted to cry because I knew that I had completely wasted this fur. Um, you know, parts that were small enough that I couldn't get another piece out of them if I turned it around. So. Um, continuing pattern, draping. Um, so if you're going to cover a, a foam shape with fabric, learning how to drape yes. fabric is pretty important. Um, like I say, you can do the tape thing again, but it takes a long time. Uh, and like I say, if you're doing a one-off, it's easier just to learn how to drape. Um, so like with the, the foam head up here, the left of the foam box stuff. Um, he's, he's bilateral, so all I have to do is make a pattern for one side of his head, and I can, you know, flop it. I usually start by taking, uh, like a piece of fabric store fleece, sweatshirt fleece works well, and just take a, a big enough chunk that I can just lay it over the top of this, and then I start down here, and I'll find where the center is and I'll just start putting pins in. And as I go, it's gonna start developing places where it naturally needs to have a dart. And so I will pin those darts in. And then I'll go along and I'll take a sharp scissors. I've got a pair of those, those little fiskers that are probably about that big with a really sharp point on them. And those are really handy for trimming in a situation like this. And so I'll start trimming along that center line and I'll try and clean up that piece of fabric so it starts looking like a pattern piece that's been applied. Um, I'll go in and I'll cut the darts so that instead of having a loop of fabric sticking up, it'll be just two pieces of fabric that are butted next to each other. Um, if you have to and you need to like section out the pattern, say, well, in this case, it was a fox, so it needed to have uh, some muzzle fur that was kind of its own color. There we go. Muzzle fur that was white, and then you know the back of the head was this uh, longer fur, and then this actually was the same fur, but I, I ended up trimming it down. Um, so I had to actually create a separation line in the pattern. So the, that's the point where you want to do it while it's still sitting on the head, so that you know exactly how these things are going to lay. If you take that pattern off of there and lay it out flat, suddenly you've lost all points of reference from your foam you know, structure. So you want to do it while it's still on the head. And I, I just do it sharpening, you know, keep going. Um, the other thing to remember is that along the way, you're going to have places where you can hide things. You can cover things up. Um, you know, this is this is all this is all the raw fur. Um, I'm going to trim this away and get it so that's you know not not so shaggy, especially like right in this area, because you want that to be kind of a nice little, uh, little muzzle sort of thing. And trim it away around the lip line so that it's uh, it's a lot cleaner. And then 
this area right here, there's going to be a nose there. So if the stitching is starting to show, it doesn't matter. You're going to get a nose glued right on top of that. Um, this is the beginning of the loop. There's the bear. Um, oh, um, two, different, two different types of fabric, very similar in color. What I wanted, a much shorter but complete fur right here behind his eyes. And then he's got this big shaggy fur that's coming off of his head. I don't think I trimmed any of that. Um, this is a much shorter fur, but you can see where I've, I've actually gone in here. And I bought one of those men's grooming razors. Mm -hmm. It's just a real small, you know, uh, plug-in charger, chargeable razor. And uh, I'll tend to use that, or I'll tend to use a really nice sharp scissors to get in there and trim away along the lip line along that. Because if there's, if there's a big mass of fur in there, number one, it's uncomfortable to puppeteer because it's, you, want, you want those lips to meet. And if there's a bunch of puff in there, it doesn't feel right when you're puppeteering. I'm just trying to see if there's something that illustrates the point that I don't No. You um, have 20 minutes. So okay. If you want to have eyes or answer questions or. Yeah. Does anybody have questions so far? We see the finished uh, box. Finished box. Yeah, somewhere along there. And that's not completely finished either. Um, you'll, you'll notice I was in a hurry, so I started making mistakes. And the difference between an amateur and a professional is that a professional knows how to cover up their mistakes. <laughs> and so when I got to uh, doing the lip line on some of these guys, I took it, to, I took it too far. And I ended up uh, leaving some nicks not in, in the uh, fur itself, but in the backing. Mm -hmm. So there were kind of loose fibers sticking up. And it really didn't look as clean as I wanted it to. So I decided at that point, everybody was going to get a little piece of felt, kind of like Grover's interior lip. So everybody got this as a style element to cover up my mistake. <laughs> uh, and it's totally cool. Um, we uh, th these were for the Minnesota Lottery. Uh, we did a commercial with Kent Herbeck and Bert Blyleven. And uh, when they came to me, they said, "We want Emma Otter's Jug Band Christmas." And in <laughs> fact, their whole storyboard consisted of freeze frames from Emma Otter's Jug Band Christmas. <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, you guys know I can't recreate these because they are designs owned by this and etc." Like, no. We're cool with that. We just want you to make critters. I'm like, okay, cool. And so along the way, I got a lot of creative input, um, being able to just basically tell them, okay, this is how the puppets are going to turn out. I'm going to make them as professional as possible, but you have to trust me. I'll make you something cool, but you know, you got to you got to let me work. So um, the loom was a lot of fun. Um, he ended up getting. Uh, Let's see, he had two different sets of wings. One was the folded set, and then another set was like big outstretched set that had um, posable uh, fingertips slash feather tips and uh, removable arm rods so that you could do like a, a flappy bit. I might um, be able to find those photos, but I'll them. Okay. Um, the deer was a full-size deer, and- uh, There he, was, he is on the boxes and back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> To make that pattern, I actually went to a hunting store and bought one of those um, foam, or not foam, uh, one of the taxidermy. Not, not a taxidermy, but like a, a, a archery arrow. Uh, oh, target. Target. And uh, so I, I did the I did the tape deal to the archery target. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he's like a waterline model, so you know the, his legs are completely not there. Uh, but I built his entire body pod out of the L200, and it had enough structure that I didn't need to put any extra support inside there. And so when the puppeteer was operating him, he had one hand up in the head, and the body was literally sitting on his head like this. So he was able to you know, walk around and have the, have the puppet do that. Um, the bear is a big bag puppet, so he didn't really have any body pod inside, uh, but he had big mitts. So there was uh, two people operating him. Um, I really wanted to give him a green hat and a necktie. <laughs> um, the beaver was fun. 
Oh, there's, there's the deer, it was water wine. Um, in fact, these antlers are some of the antlers from the decoy. <laughs> I just, I, I, I put wires in them and mounted them into the head. He's got a L200 cranium plate so that it's stiff enough that I can actually mount the wires in there. One of the things that we are awful at and we're trying to work on is we are not good at taking photos of our own stuff. <laughs> so it goes out the door and it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, I mean, we're working in the house, so we don't have room for a photo studio either. So it, it's really tough. Um, but the, the loon, uh, you notice the loon, the pattern of the loon, all those dots on his back are individual felt squares that I glued on one at a time because I couldn't figure out how else to do it. Um, Working on the photo studio, you know, it was a pop-up. Things are kind of like a pop-up camera, but the interior is, is like a photo. Yes, yeah. those are awesome. Yeah. And if we had room for that, we'd just pop it up when we need it and then put it away. You're still going to make a room to pop it, though. Yeah, that's <laughs> the um, we're, we're both artists and we're both collectors, so we're living in the middle of our workspace and our collection space. And well, I mean, I understand how to put a box in the um, so, Let's talk about eyes a little bit. Okay. Since um, that kind of an important thing. Every, everybody wonders about eyes. So <coughs> there's, there is a great place online, uh, actually two places. Uh, out, of, out of the Box Puppets provides really good injection mold plastic eyes. And these are, these are fantastic. They've got the post on the back and a little circle that you go and you go. it's locked in. Oh, there's, that's awesome. Um, oh, hey, yeah, this is draping right here. <laughs> um, I did a Sherlock Holmes puppet. And I went through the whole process of making the foam skull and everything. And I actually, I spent way too much time putting the mini seams in that for the shape that I eventually got. But, um, so, and actually, in this case, I was in such a hurry, I didn't use an intermediate fabric. I actually did the draping with the actual fabric I was going to use to cover his head. So um, it's flesh tone Antron fleece, and I just kind of went at it. And you can see, um, because I was doing it that way, I didn't have a chance to take that pattern off of there. You know, if I was using like a fabric store fleece, you eventually take that fabric off the form, lay it out, trace it onto a piece of paper, and then if you want to sew it by machine, you can add seam allowance to where it's necessary around the outside. And I usually just do a quarter inch seam allowance on the, the sides that I'm going to sew on the machine. In this case, because I was doing it straight up like this, his whole face had to be hand stitched because there wasn't an opportunity to add seam allowance to do it on a machine. So, um, if you see the inside of his face, it's a lot like a joker from those Jack McClane cards. Um, but every one of these seats, this is all hand stitched. And it, it, the time that I spent hand stitching that probably would have been saved if I had just gone in and made a pattern and done it the way I normally do it. The, making the pattern is a time saving thing. Um, but I fooled myself, and I wasted a lot of time in the chain. Um, but uh, so in, in the end, um, he ended up getting uh, another lip line around here that I hand stitched all the way around that folded over and glued down to the interior palette. Um, I think it's cool. It's fun. Let's see. Eyes. Ah, right. Out of the box puppets. Um, I'll, I'll just pass around this bag, um, except for this one. So those are some of the, those are some of the things you can get. Now there are there are domes, just white domes, and they have those in two sizes. They have that weird kind of egg-shaped eye with a dot that's all the eye. Oh, there it is. Hi, Sean. Is that the heroin? Yes, the eyelids came afterwards. Um, uh, yes, this is a felt piece of tinga on top of 
a uh, kind of oval shaped eye. I custom made. Um, I have a very small vacuum form machine. If you don't know what a vacuum former is, uh, every time you buy a package of cookies, that clear plastic tray that the cookies are sitting in, that's a piece of vacuum form plastic. What they do is they have a mold, they heat up a sheet of plastic, and they suck it down over that, and then it stays in that form. They trim it out, and it becomes your cookie tray. Um, you can use that process for doing all kinds of things, like making stormtrooper armor. That's how the original Star Wars stormtroopers were made. Um, they do cowlings for exercise machines. They, you know, vacuum forming is a really flexible process. Um, I tend to use it to make domes for eyes. And so what I'll do is I'll start out, this is a piece of resin that is, has a shallow dome to it. And I use this as my mold, and I'll suck down a piece of plastic over the top of that. Now my, my little tiny vacuum form machine, some people have seen the, uh, the old Mattel vacuum former. The toy that you can get in the 60s, 50s. Um, those are okay, they don't work great. Uh, but uh, the dental industry makes little dental vacuum formers, and they have about a five and a half by five and a half image area. And you, uh, it's, it's like an industrial little thing, it's like a fire plug at the bottom that has a oven on top. But you can find those on eBay sometimes for as little as a hundred bucks. If you want to buy one new, they're probably about two hundred or something. But um, they're really, really handy. And if you want to get into vacuum forming, that's something to look up. There's whole communities online that will talk about vacuum forming. Um, I suppose there might be some makerspaces that kind of have Yes. Like um, and if you are interested in makerspaces, uh, the Twin Cities has a fantastic makerspace called the Hack Factory, and I would suggest looking them up. They have, a, for, for a fee, you can become a member and you get access to their whole workshop. They have a wood shop, they have plastics, they have a sign router, they have a, a 3D printer, they have a laser cutter, and you can learn how to operate these machines just by paying your fee. You go in and they'll teach you how to use them and then you can use them for your project. 24-7 access, and they also have an industrial sewing machine that's mine. There you go. <laughs> that's awesome, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, okay, so uh, other other things you can use for eyes. Oh, this is kind of cool. Um, you vacuum form of clear plastic, and then paint the backside. You get this lovely glossy exterior, and you can get all kinds of effects going on with the type of pupil that you want to have. And that's always fun. I, um, I've done several uh, workshops at puppetry festivals doing this exact thing. Um, yeah, we've never, we, we don't have a complete puppet we've ever done that way. We don't have a puppet that I've, I've ever felt like doing that to. Um, ping pong balls. Everybody knows that Kermit the Frog's eyes were ping pong balls. And they're still really handy. That's actually the bad type. That's the bad type. That's a polyethylene ping pong ball. You want to get the ones that are um, matte. They're, they're uh, matte color instead of that glossy color. Um, GlassEyesOnline.com not only supplies glass eyes for taxidermy, but also supplies plastic eyes. And again, they have this post on the back that you lock in. They have these. This, this size of eyes is one that I use the most. And they have about a dozen colors. So you get a blue and orange and pink and red and green and uh, all kinds of things. What kind of those have What's the place called? Uh, GlassEyesOnline.com. And I think it's on the sheet. Um, but, but the, the specific type of eye, what is it called? Um, I look under teddy bear eyes. And that, that tends to that tends to give you at least a menu that you can find those from. CSR crafts. Really wide Okay. CSR crafts. That's probably not on the list. I don't know. Um, the other type of eye that I use is this sort of foam squishy ball. And a lot of them you can find these in toys. Um, they're tough to get other than buying them at the toy store. Uh, if you go to Etsy, our friend from Puppet Pie Shop 
on Etsy has actually ordered from China a supply of one inch versions and about this size version in white because toy companies don't use white balls in toys because they're not colorful, they're not fun. So she actually had to go and special order about 4,000 of those from China. And so she is now selling them through her shop on Etsy. Um, and in fact, I've got to order some more myself. Um, let's see. Uh, fabric otherwise, um, you may hear that the Muppets, the interior of the mouths on some of the Muppets are made from a product called Ultra Suede. Um, it's not readily available at fabric stores anymore because it's kind of gone out of fashion. But I found that at thrift stores, if you can find thrift stores that have lots of clothes from the 1980s, you'll find lots of ultra suede in this puce color, and that makes a great amount of material. It's kind of a natural sort of um, natural sort of color to, to work with. Um, but you can also find the 80s were like red pantsuits and stuff for ladies out of that stuff. Um, SR Harris has a really good supply last time I checked out. SR Harris has bolts. <laughs> um, it's still 50 bucks a yard. Probably. Uh, SR Harris is 50% off of uh, yeah. the yeah. original price was. <laughs> <laughs> um, something else that I do with, uh, with a little vacuum pump machine to make eye domes is I'll use, this is like one of those paint pallets you get at the art store. And so um, I know some guys will just buy these and cut them out and use that dome. But I don't want to pay that much, so I'll just buy this and then I put this in the back of form machine and sucks the plastic down over it and get this shape and then I'll turn that out. Um, these make great eyes. I, I use these pretty extensively early on when I was making them. Um, Uh, mouth palettes. There are several ways to do the mouth palettes. Um, and I'm talking about the interior that you see and the interior that you touch. Now, I've, I've already mentioned that I use the car headliner for the car that you touch. But a lot of mouth palettes are several layers. It depends on what kind of effect you want to get. So sometimes you'll make a puppet that has a really flat, flat on flat kind of interior mount palette. And those, if you don't want it to bend at all, you can use something really nice and stiff. Um, Ernie on Sesame Street has a really stiff kind of palette because he's just a big, you know, I mean, they, they, he doesn't do any face scrunchy sort of moves or anything like that. And it's just kind of a stiff. Um, Bert is that way. Foggy Bear is that way. Um, and really, I'm going to say, I should have said it earlier, there's no wrong way to build a puppet. If it does what you want it to do, and it looks the way you want it to look, you win. So if you want to make your puppet not out of uh, Anton fleece or fake fur, and you want to make it out of old towels, do it. Because that's kind of cool. I like that texture. Um, but for, uh, he's got a black palette. That is uh, great. <laughs> from, uh, from the sitcom pilot that we did. And, uh, We'll never ever see again. <laughs> um, I think he died in it. But um, so uh, so, um, so the, the difference between these two puppets, there's okay. Um, he's got a flat, hard palette, and what he's got for his uh, uh, palette, the structure inside of his mouth, is foam core. And I use that because it's light. And I also use that because I know that the puppeteer who's handling this puppet knows that if he really stresses it, he can break it. So he's, I know he's going to be gentle with it. I know he's going to operate it with it, uh, you know, in a professional manner. Probably don't want to do that with a puppet that you're going to give to a child. Because they're going to want to stretch the face and they're going to want to you know, bite things and, and that kind of stuff. And so they'll break it. Um, if you want something that's good and hard, um, you can use Sintra board, which is a PVC board. They use it in sign making. Um, and if you want to find that, you can call up a sign making shop and they'll be able to buy it. Or you can use book board, the stuff that they use to do book covers with. Um, it tends to be thin, fairly thin, but strong and, and uh, stiff. 
Um, this guy, this duck, his bill is actually built on top of the same uh, sock puppet pattern from uh, Project Puppet. So underneath all of this is the sock puppet pattern. I've added a nubbin on the top of his head that's just stuffed with the, uh, uh, stuffing. And the beak was something that I built up. Um, I actually created a foam, like a, a clipped foam model that fit on the front of the puppet, and then I covered it with uh, fleece. But his palette, I wanted it to be real kind of squishy and stuff. Um, you can use this sort of thing to replace cardboard. This is red rubber gasket. This is toilet gasket. Um, this, this particular piece is old, so it's not quite as flexible as it used to be. But um, uh, Cookie Monster on Sesame Street, the inside of his mouth is actually built on a football bladder, if I'm not mistaken. It's nice and rubbery, basketball bladder. Um, so it's nice and rubbery and really squishy, and you can really get a lot of move out of it. Gordon, let me just be clear on this with your pouts. There's still like some fabric underneath that's stitched into the the rest of this is gone, or is this being used somehow stitched in? Or I wish I had a way of drawing this out for you. Um, is this just adding detail? You were kind of trying to figure out where you're going with these. So um, you'll, you'll note you'll note on the project puppet patterns that what you've got. And is, that was where I got a little confused on the project puppet pattern was the mouth. So okay. Yeah. So um, on a project puppet pattern, what they'll do is they'll They'll give you the shape of the mouth palette, and then you know it gets folded in. So that's a piece of foam. Then on the inside of that will generally be uh, a structural piece of material. So it could be something hard, like bookboard or citra or whatever, and that will give you this kind of flat sort of feel. Or you can use um, like a sheet of fun foam. So it gives it just a little bit of structure, but it's still nice and flexible. Um, you can use a piece of rubber gasket on the inside of that. And that gives it a little structure, but it's still kind of flexible. And it gives it, um, well, structure is the word. Uh, and then over the top of that is what you're going to put the final layer that you see when you look inside the puppet's mouth. So when I'm doing puppets, I'll put a piece of felt in there. And that piece of felt isn't glued to the loose mouth plate. It is actually sewn into the skin of the head. So what you're talking about is you've got the felt here sewn into the head, and you've got the stiff part on the back of it on the inside. Well, um, the piece of foam that is the mouth plate with the stiff part is a separate piece, and then I'll pulse. I'll stitch the head fabric together, and I'll stitch that inner fabric that you see as the interior palette to the head skin. Right? So that's making a, a complete kind of sock. Right? Instead of having a hole. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say, we are at time. Okay. I want, maybe if you wanted to do quickly hands and arm lines, and then Anybody who wants extensive tutoring at the end? <laughs> well, we here's, here's the thing. At this, at this point, I will say to you, if you would like, you can get my business card. It's got my email address on there. If you have questions, I am happy to try to help you via email. Um, I do not do classes, so to speak, yet. Um, there may be a time when I get into that. Uh, and so I'll try to make sure that you know, if we keep in contact, I'll let you know. Um, but uh, yes, you are welcome to email me anytime with any question because I will try to answer it to the best of my ability. Um, okay, so doing hands. Um, two different types of hands. Glove hands, which are very, very simple. And uh, posable hands, which I tend to do uh, if you look at like, if you look at Kermit the Frog, or uh, scooter, or you know, one of one of those Muppets. They have the little hands that are far too small to be a human hand, but you know that they've got something inside that makes them posable. And generally, they'll have a removable control rod, 
so that if they need to take that rod out and pin it to his coat or you know something or stick it to his face or whatever. Do you have? So, anyhow, the way I do it, I start out with the handshake. And usually it's three fingers and a thumb, like a cartoon character. Uh, I'll draw a paper pattern. And if I'm doing a custom character, sometimes the fingers are shorter, sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're fatter. It just depends on how I want that hand to look. Uh, this is a little nice kind of puppy. So, so I'll take that, I'll take that pattern shape and I'll cut out two pieces of foam so that I have I have these two pieces. This is one hand. And that's my foam. Um, so I'll cut out two pieces of foam like this. And this is this is two parts of one hand. So then this I create an armature goes inside. Now if you're doing a lot of the same hand, it's really easy to take a board and drive some nails in it so you can do these armatures really quickly. Um, but after a while you understand, you, you, you figure out how long this piece of wire needs to be and you can just like cut several pieces and bend them. Um, this, is, this is armature wire that you can get at the art store. Um, when I buy it, I buy that great big roll loop. Um, it usually costs about 30 bucks, but I'm still going through my first roll. Um, so and it's, it's, it's really easy to bend, but it's, it's got enough um, body to it so that when you pose it, it stays in place. You don't want to go any thinner than that unless you're working with little tiny hands. Um, but so I, I make this, I make sure each finger has a loop so that there's plenty of, plenty of body to work with. So that gets, that gets good. And this is just kind of tacking with hot glue for um, showing you guys. What I'll do is, okay, I've got, got two halves of the same hand. Each side gets contact with these. Okay. Right. Um, by the way, putting, putting foam together, Use contact easy. <laughs> if you know what that is, um, uh, go to the hardware store, find uh, weld wood contact adhesive. Get the stinky stuff, not the earth friendly kind. Um, the stinky stuff just works better. Um, and be sure that you have lots of ventilation and you're wearing protective gear because it rots your brain. But so you do uh, put contact heat adhesive on both sides. I usually place the wire in at that point. Um, this little guy down here is a pocket that goes on the pinky side of the hand. So the hole is here. And I glue that in because that's going to be the receptacle for your arm rod. Once those are in, I take both pieces and I glue them together and I press them down so it kind of encases it and makes it into a bendy toy. Then, if you okay, if you want to get really persnickety about being a perfectionist, you can take your contact adhesive and tap it around all the way around the outside, and then you get a toothpick, you push it in, and you pinch it together all the way around the outside. And that's what I did on some of these. You have a picture. You see that? I was I was being a perfectionist, so yeah, that's good. And then it ends up cleaning up that edge and make it just kind of a nice little sandwich. Um, uh, if you're in a hurry, you don't have to do that. Uh, if I'm in a hurry, I'll take a scissors and I'll just trim it down a little bit and make it kind of roll over the edges. Um, you take the same pattern, you trace it out on your fabric, and then you put two pieces of fabric face to face. Put it in the sewing machine and you stitch around that line. And you trim it away. And you have a little glove. You turn it inside out. And then this is foam. You can shove this through that little tiny wrist hole, and get it up in there, and work it into the fingers. And then your hand is filled with the foam with the wire that you can now pose. 
thing is you got to be careful when you're when you're stitching that hand onto the arm. You got to remember where your little receptacle hole is. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't bring it. I didn't bring an arm rod. Do you have to bring an arm rod with? Do you have an arm rod that looks like that? No. Oh, you got that. I tend to make my arm rods look like this. They have a P-shaped paddle on the end of them. And the reason why is because um, I, can, I can take that P-shaped paddle, push it up through here and bend it and kind of push it around the corner and that locks it in.